Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State and Gotham Gazette, presents Race to Represent, a MNN election initiative. Hello, I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. New Yorkers will be voting in the general election on Tuesday, November 6th. They will be casting their ballots for offices including governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, state senate, state assembly, and state comptroller. Today, we bring you a debate with the candidates running for New York State Comptroller. The winner will take office in January of 2019. The Comptroller's office has wide-reaching powers crucial to the fiscal well-being of New York. It manages the $200-plus billion state pension fund, audits state agencies and state contracts, reports on state finances, and oversees the economic affairs of city governments, including New York City. Joining us today is the Democratic candidate, Tom DiNapoli, the incumbent, the Green Party candidate, Mark Dunley, the Libertarian candidate, Kruger Gallaudet, and the Republican candidate, Jonathan Trichter. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started. The first question, we're going to start with you, Comptroller DiNapoli, and move to my right. The first question is, how do you describe the job you're applying for, in your case, reapplying for, the job of New York State Comptroller? Well, I think it's the best job in state government. It's why it's been a privilege for me to serve in this position. I hope I have a chance to do it for another term. It's really the office that promotes accountability and transparency in state government and in local government as well. Uh, I don't have a, a vote. I don't make any decisions on how the money's spent, but I do have a voice. And the controller exercises that voice through our budget reports, through our analysis of state fiscal practices, with our evaluation of local government finances, with our audits, where for state government, local government, we do promote the taxpayer interest. And in New York, we have another added responsibility, a little different than some other states, where I serve as trustee for the New York Common Retirement Fund. That's the fund that provides the retirement for uh, 1.1 million New Yorkers who are either retired public workers or public workers who look forward to be retired one day. So uh, there's a broad range of responsibilities. A lot of it has to do with the back office operation of the state, contracts, approving payments, and so on. But we've been an effective partner in keeping New York moving forward. And I want to continue to do that, look out for the taxpayer interest, and make New York an even better state than it is already. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dunley, how do you describe the job of state controller? Well, I think Tom has done a fairly good job outlining the um, present responsibilities of the state controller. I would like to change that a bit. I think the state controller uh, needs to be the fiscal watchdog uh, for the state to make sure the money is being uh, spent properly and wisely. Uh, I think there needs to be a more aggressive effort by the state controller to crack down on, on corruption uh, within state government, which is quite uh, pervasive. Uh, I think we need to particularly go after both the uh, state authorities and their incurrent of debt and their improper expenditure practices. Um, but the main reason I personally am running is because for the last five years I've worked with 350.org to try to get institutions in New York State and around the world to divest from, from fossil fuels. We've managed to divest $7 trillion from 1,000 institutions uh, because of the role of, of climate change. Earlier this year, we were able to convince uh, New York City uh, to divest uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, we did get Governor Cuomo to agree to support state uh, divestment, did manage to get about 50 state legislators to co-sponsor legislation I helped write, but have not been able to convince Tom yet to divest our state pension fund. And if we had divested a decade ago, we'd have about $22 billion more money in the state pension fund. Uh, and so that's one of the things I like to protect taxpayers from is the impact of climate change. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gallaudet, how do you describe the role that you're applying for? Well, first of all, I just want to point out I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm from the private sector. I have an MBA. Uh, my first job was as an auditor for General Electric, so I actually have experience auditing uh, uh, other organizations. Um, but like a true politician, I may not answer the question that you asked because I'm here really to convince people to vote libertarian, uh, particularly in the controller's uh, job because uh, libertarians, I think, are probably the most fiscally responsible uh, party on the planet. and. Uh, uh, if you want, uh, you know, if you want to split split your ticket, this would be a good place to do it because uh, you know we've had Mr. DiNapoli in there for quite a few years. If you want change, I think uh, vote uh, vote for me. If you want change in general, vote Libertarian. Um, I will elaborate more on on my uh, thoughts about why you should vote the Libertarian ticket, um, and I will reserve that for another question that you ask that I probably won't answer. Mr. Trichter, how do you describe the role of the job that you're applying for? As the most powerful, underappreciated, and underutilized office in New York State. It is the top watchdog and chief fiscal officer of New York. 
The job shouldn't be held by a politician. It should be run by a professional. It's supposed to police Albany and Albany excess and Albany politicians, and instead the office has been held by Albany politicians. I covered the office as a public finance investment banker at J.P. Morgan, where I had a private sector view to the previous controller, who was a longtime Albany hand and was then hauled off to prison. And to fill that vacancy, the current controller, Tom sitting to my right, was hand-selected by Shelley Silver over the objection of every editorial board in New York State, because as the governor of his own party said at the time, he is totally and thoroughly unqualified. And he has since returned the favor to the state legislature, who appointed him to uphold and strengthen the status quo in Albany at the expense of ordinary New Yorkers and all the good that this office could do those ordinary New Yorkers. The powers of the office are formidable. He's the sole trustee of a $200 billion pension fund. It's the market power of a Saudi prince. And this controller has basically covered up his pension performance and his investment performance, which he has underperformed to the tune of $65 billion and made up for in taxes, local taxes. The reason that New York State's localities tax so much, property taxes are so high, are due to two things, Medicaid and pension costs, pension underperformance by the sole trustee of its pension fund, Tom DiNapoli. There are two or three other incredibly powerful tools that the controller has that could disrupt the status quo and fix many of the vexing fiscal problems that government groups wring their hands over and struggle with figuring out how to amend. And I'm telling you, the controller could do it single-handedly and unilaterally. We'll get back to not. some of those issues. Um, I'm going to move on to a second question. But first, Controller DiNapoli, uh, Mr. Trichter said a few things about you, give you a few seconds to respond to anything you want to. Well, now I understand why Jonathan's running. He views himself as being a Saudi prince. And he's using his very effective career of being a political operative, largely for Democratic candidates over many, many years. That's really what his bio indicates. Uh, a lot of exaggerations, a lot of misunderstanding and misrepresentation of my record and of the office. I'm very proud of the fact that I became controller because a bipartisan coalition of legislators want to restore integrity to this office. And I'm very proud that I was elected by the people in 2010 and 2014 with most of the editorial boards endorsing me when they saw my performance. So I have a record I'm very proud of that I'm proud to stand on. So let's move on to the second question, which is now that we've described the role a little bit and some of you got into some of uh, the answers to this next question, but what are your specific qualifications for the role? And of course, Controller Napoli, you're reapplying so you could talk a little bit about what you think your accomplishments are, but for those in the challenger seats, uh, what makes you qualified to fill this role? We're going to start with you, Mr. Gallaudet. What, what are your qualifications to become state controller? Um, you want honesty? Not a whole lot. I've got uh, an MBA. I've been in the private sector for a long time. I was uh, with General Electric. I was an auditor, so I'm probably the only person on the stage that has actually performed an audit. But uh, I have no, uh, you know, I've, I've held no political office other than the Board of Education at Tuckahoe. Um, but, uh, but what I would bring is a fresh pair of eyes on the whole job, the whole point of, of the controller's job. Uh, you know, you know why, why does New York have such a huge pension fund? Why are we managing it? Uh, could it be done differently? Um, also, the, you know, the, whole, the whole issue of who's controlling the controller. He reports to no one. Uh, there's you know, there's no, uh, no accountability. So that, that can lead to a corruption and graft. I'm not saying that has happened, but um, uh, that, you know, that's possible. Anyway, so my qualification would be a, a fresh pair of eyes, plus, uh, um, as I say, I think, I think the, the voters should vote Libertarian right across the ticket. And We're going to come back in a minute more. to ask you a little bit more about what a Libertarian approach to being controller would be. But first, Mr. Trichter, your qualifications. So I'm a public finance and public pension expert. I served as a public finance investment banker at J.P. Morgan. I then ran a municipal restructuring line of business for a restructuring firm. And in that capacity, I was tapped by Pew Charitable, Trusts, Pew Charitable Trusts to help lead a SWAT team of pension professionals that ran around the country to apply reforms and assistance to struggling pension funds around the USA. And in that capacity, I also led the most comprehensive restructuring of a public safety pension plan in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, and I rely on those laurels. On top of that, I'm a lifelong Democrat who nevertheless was tapped and asked by the Republican Party and the Conservative Party of New York to run on their line due to my qualifications and expertise. I was given a dispensation, something called a Wilson Bakula, and it's the first time that the Republicans gave such a dispensation to a statewide candidate since 1970. I'd like to think it's, about, it's because of my qualifications and deep background and expertise in public finance and public pensions and my success in restructuring a public safety plan in Jacksonville, Florida. At the time, one of the few successful and maybe still one of the only successful comprehensive restructuring of a struggling public pension plans in America. And as you mentioned, you have been a Democrat until seeking this position. And as Mr. Napoli noted, you've worked on some 
campaigns, including for Democrats, uh, what has that experience taught you and prepared you for this role? Well, I hope it's not a critique, Tom. I hope you don't uh, hold it against me that I've worked for Democrats before. I've worked for fiscally reasonable and pragmatic Democrats. I myself am a fiscally pragmatic individual and would take that approach to the controller's office. Only in New York does that make you a fiscal conservative if you can actually do math uh, and balance budgets. Uh, and I could talk at length about the controller's performance, which he claims to be par excellence and talks about his own editorial endorsements. But may I also point out that in 2010, every newspaper in the state endorsed his opponent, other than Newsday's hometown paper. So I'm not sure what he's We're going to get into, when he speaks into some about of that record. We're going to start right now, obviously, with Mr. Napoli, your, yeah. your chance to talk yeah, well, about your it was, it was more than It was more than Newsday. And, uh, you know, I report to the people of the state of New York. And uh, that's who the ultimate boss is for the controller and for an elected official like this. And unlike John, uh, I, I have my values as a Democrat. And I've stuck with them all my life. I grew up in a good Republican household, but I'm a Democrat. And in Trump's America, to become a Republican after you've been a Democrat all these years and to sign on to the Republican agenda and the conservative party agenda, does that mean, that, John, that you've agreed now not to be pro-choice on a woman's right to choose and control her own body? Marriage equality, those are the kind of values that the conservative party stands for. If, if you had to sell yourself to get a nomination, I don't think that's the best standard to be running for office. I have a clear record, uh, like Mr. Gallaudet, I was a school board member for 10 years. I began as a local official, elected 11 times to the state assembly representing my community, served on the assembly ways committee, ways and means committee, the fiscal committee for the assembly. And I've done the job uh, since 2007, restoring the integrity of the office, managing through tough fiscal times, the great recession, growing the pension fund at a, to be at a record all-time high. And Pew has acknowledged that we are one of only four state pension plans in the country that is over 90% funded. That is an enviable record. Okay, thank you. We're going to come back to you in just a minute, but we're going to let Mr. Dunley talk about his qualifications for the job. Well, unlike John or Tom, uh, I'm a Green. I'm not a Democrat. Um, as a student at uh, Albany Law School and RPI, I uh, started the New York Public Interest Research Group and have had many decades of work. I probably have testified on the state budget more than any other person running for state office uh, at this point. I graduated at the top of my class at RPI uh, in management at Albany Law School. I focused on uh, issues of taxation and corporations because I assume I'd be competing on that issue. Uh, once I graduated uh, from law school, I was an elected town board member in my town. I'm probably one of the few elected officials that can say every year I've been in office, I cut taxes. Um, and one of the things I did is I put all the town contracts out to bid. Uh, one of the results of that was that the county Democratic chairperson ended up in federal prison for two years uh, because it turned out he was skimming money off of our town insurance contract. Uh, before I got there. I was 22 years old. The first time I was involved in litigation, suing over uh, how local government, in this case uh, New York State and Albany County, were circumventing the restrictions on current of, of public debt. I wrote the law that gave uh, taxpayers the right to sue uh, over illegal expenditure of uh, taxpayers' funds when I was uh, uh, a law student. I was one of the co-founders of the Fiscal Policy Institute and had spent many years doing things such as promoting legislation to uh, curb the abuses in the economic development program. Okay, we're going to start with you, Mr. Trichter, this round. And if you want to take a, a moment to respond to Mr. Napoli's uh, comments about your beliefs and, and switching your party uh, under President Trump from Democrat to Republican, yeah, you can Tom do that. Uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me ask the question. You can start there and then move into your answer to the question. This question will go to everybody but you first, Mr. Trichter. And this is about perhaps the most powerful aspect of this job, as, as, other, as some of you have mentioned, which is <laughs> management and being the sole trustee of the public pension fund that's valued over $200 billion, how you would approach that awesome responsibility as controller if elected or re-elected. Mr. Trichter. Sorry for interrupting. So if Tom wants to run against Donald Trump as he's running for re-election for controller, he's more than welcome to. But I'm running for a professional office which requires a private sector set of skills, including being responsible for investing over $200 billion in public assets. Now, Tom DiNapoli has basically misrepresented his own performance investing those funds. His expectation was to earn 7.5% over the 11 years he's been in office. He's only earned 6%. And the difference, the delta between his expectations and what he's earned, translates into $65 billion in underperformance. He's had to make up for that $65 billion in debt by taxing New York localities. And he's done it very aggressively. The state controller has siphoned up local tax dollars 10 times more than localities around the countries have 
for their own public pension problems and underperformance. So what I would do is I would invest the public pension assets passively in S&P indexes, the equity portfolio, and by doing that, I could basically ban hedge funds and private equity. And this man, this Tom DiNapoli, the uh, state controller, has spent over and paid over $6 billion in fees to hedge fund managers and other alternative fund managers since he's been in office. I call him the $6 billion man. If it sounds like a lot, it's only because it is. The alternative asset portfolio of the pension fund under DiNapoli has underperformed. So he's paid $6 billion to hedge funds for underperformance, whereas he would have done much better for New York retirees had he passively invested the equity portfolio in S&P indexes. That $6 billion should be retirees, not hedge fund managers. So we're going to come to you, Comptroller DiNapoli, to discuss your management and, and being the sole trustee of the pension fund. It's been excellent and it's been strong. I don't know if I have the time to respond to everything Jonathan has said, but uh, he uh, doesn't put that footnote in about the global financial crisis that happened during my tenure. I don't think he's suggesting I'm responsible for it. Perhaps he is. Uh, when you consider our performance, uh, with, even with that year in the 10-year look back, 11-year look back, it's an excellent performance. Uh, my obligation uh, ultimately is to the members of the system. That's my fiduciary responsibility. And that means our goal is to have a smart investment strategy, but also to make sure we don't fall behind on funding our pensions. You look at the states that are in bad shape. Uh, very often, they're in bad budget condition and fiscal conditions because their pensions are poorly funded. They haven't paid the bill. Well, we have. That's why we are now 98% funded. And we have been ahead of other pension funds in being more conservative in our outlook, now down to 7% long-term assumed rate of return. And the strength is the diversification of our portfolio. To put all of our money in index funds would be totally irresponsible. To put all your eggs in one basket, if we didn't learn anything from the global financial crisis, you have to be diversified. Is there a premium when you put some money into the alternatives? Absolutely. But we went from $109 billion at, at, the, at the depths of the, of the global financial crisis. Now we're $209 billion. So I'm the $100 billion man, not the $6 billion Your man. liabilities are $241 and, and billion, just Tom. On so the, you're $200 on billion, dollars, of, but you've got excuse 40, me, $241 of, billion. Of, um, of the fees to, to hedge fund, you say that sometimes to diversify, that, that comes Absolutely. with the territory. You know, and so you feel comfortable about continuing that if reelected? Well, we're always looking to negotiate for, for better fees. And in some of the higher fee areas, uh, like hedge funds, we've been reducing our allocation uh, significantly. Uh, we also uh, have most of our public equities invested passively through index that are internally managed. So we actually are more efficient than many other public pension funds with our public equities. So when we pay the fees for the alternatives, it, we feel it does balance out because it gives us the strength of diversification. Uh, you, you take something like hedge funds, they actually perform better in that year of great collapse than the public equity. So if we had all our eggs in the public equity basket in the year that the market's tanked, we really would still be digging out from under it today. You'll have a chance to get back into the, to the mix here. Uh, but Mr. Dunley, how would you approach the, this position uh, managing the, the massive pension fund? Well, I usually like to remind both voters and my opponents, apparently, that actually under the state constitution, um, public pensions are treated as a contractual obligation. So it's really the taxpayers that are at risk more than the employees. I had to be a beneficiary of the fund through my, through my wife. As I said earlier, um, if the state had divested, as we had asked uh, a decade ago from fossil fuels, um, the pension fund would have an extra $22 uh, billion, about $20,000 uh, per member of the pension fund. I do agree we need to cut the fees we're paying um, for outside mm -hmm. consultants, uh, particularly because we are following so much of the um, you know, index of the fund. I do applaud Tom for uh, divesting the state pension fund from private prison. I think that was the correct decision. I'm a little bit confused, though, if we can divest from private pensions, why we cannot apply the same thing to companies that are literally destroying the planet. The IPCC put out a report yesterday saying that we have 12 years to completely end the use of fossil fuels. When the world is saying that an industry has to end, that's not a wise financial investment to continue somewhere between 6 to $11 billion We're going to give Controller Napoli a chance to respond on that, but anything else in, in your last 15 seconds, anything else about the managing the pension fund as Controller that you want to highlight for voters? Is there any, any other priorities you would have? Well, I, I do think, you know, the statutory responsibility is to try to get an 8% rate of return. Um, I understand we're about uh, 57 over the last decade. I would like certainly to try to bump that up a bit. Okay. Mr. Gallaudet, uh, managing the, the pension fund as a sole trustee, any uh, 
any priorities if you were elected? Well, one, I don't like the concept of being a sole trustee, so I would en encourage the legislature to pass uh, uh, some sort of act that would uh, create maybe a board that oversees the pension fund rather than just uh, having a sole trustee. Um, one thing I learned at GE is nothing is sacred. Uh, you know, uh, GE would take a look at, at everything, question whether it even has a right to exist, uh, force their their uh, their managers to uh, uh, justify why they're doing what they're doing. So I think that be my outlook going in. You know, you know why? You know why and how and what? You know, is this pension fund? Uh, it's huge. Why? Why does one person have so much control over one? one chunk of money. Okay, Controller um, Napa, let's come back to you on uh, divestment from fossil fuels. Uh, what has been your approach to that? Anything you would do differently in, sure. a, in another term? Sure. Uh, first of all, you know, it's kind of a, an overstatement to say one person is in charge of all of it. You know, in fact, we have a very elaborate system with internal staff, external advisors, advisory committees. Uh, I can assure you the pension fund is not managed based on what I think when I wake up in the morning and read the Wall Street Journal. Um, I agree with Mark. Climate is a serious itch issue, our, our, the issue of our time. Uh, it's a material risk to our portfolio. We have been a very aggressive pension fund in assessing that risk. We've been recognized by the Asset Owners Disclosure Project, which uh, evaluates how, how institutional investors are dealing with the climate issue. We were ranked uh, number three globally, number one in the country as investors that incorporate assessing climate risk in our portfolio decisions. So we have... Um, uh, been very uh, clear that we want to invest proactively in the emerging low carbon and, and green economy. We have a $7 billion uh, sustainability uh, allocation of our pension fund. We uh, trailblazed the low emission index, which I think has been a very positive contribution. Climate's a big issue, and, and just selling stock in, in fossil fuel companies is not going to solve it. Uh, a lot of New Yorkers are still driving cars with gasoline. Many people have their homes heated with natural gas or with oil. Many people in the city are on a bus that uses natural gas. A lot of transitions that have to happen. Meaning it's, good, it's still good investment. Well, mean, meaning that we have to go through a societal change and that for now in the short run, uh, we still are making money from the oil and gas stocks. But we want to use our voice as a shareholder to press corporate, because corporations have to be part of the solution. Just taking your voice away by selling all your shares is not necessarily the best way to do that. We have filed and we will continue to file shareholder resolutions to hold these companies accountable. How how are you assessing what your greenhouse gas emissions are? How are you reducing those emissions or eliminating those emissions? And fossil fuel companies are just part of it. What about utilities, transportation, agriculture? You know, this constant focus just on selling oil and gas stocks, I think, misses the broader picture of what we all have to do. On top of that, we have a decarbonization panel that's been meeting. I'm waiting for their recommendations. Perhaps they'll suggest there are some companies we should, in fact, move away from. But we want to do it in a thoughtful way. Why? We have to worry about the bottom line, protecting the interests of the members, or the employees, the retirees, and ultimately the taxpayers as well. Okay, so we're going to move on to another of the main powers of the state controller, and that is the power to conduct audits and the responsibility to conduct audits. Uh, so we're going to start with you, Mr. Dunley, on this. How would you approach that? Uh, how do you think the, the current controller has done with his power to audit, and what would you do differently? Well, you're correct that the audit is a very powerful tool. I think we need to be more aggressive about examining pay-to-play contracts. Um, as you may know, right before we did the Buffalo Billion uh, situation where the governor's top staff person was convicted of you know, rigging a $750 million bid, uh, the governor actually took away the power of the state controller to uh, oversee those type of contracts. Uh, I think any contract given to uh, individuals, agencies that uh, involve somebody who's made a campaign contribution should receive uh, additional scrutiny. One audit that I uh, did convince Tom's uh, staff to do was to audit the issue of wage step in the New York State Labor Department. We are glad they agreed that the New York State Labor Department was not doing an adequate job. We disagree with they didn't really take the steps needed to correct the problem. A billion dollars is stolen annually from people on uh, low wages, and yet the state labor department is only co uh, collecting 22 million. One audit I would do, based on my 28 years working at the Hunger Action Network, I would really audit local department of social services at the county level. They routinely fail to provide benefits to people that are entitled to it. Uh, and you know that is why we were feeding three million people out of food pantries and soup kitchens across the state. Okay, Mr. Gallaudet, the power to audit. It, it's obviously a very, very powerful tool. Um, I'm the only auditor on the stage, so I suppose that, uh, that gives me the be best qualifications for this job. But um, uh, yeah, we can audit uh, villages, towns, 
uh, cities, I believe, and uh, I think we should use it, use it uh, carefully. Don't want to become overbearing, but uh, I would use it to reduce the scope of government. We have something like 700 authorities. Why do we need all these authorities? Um, so my uh, yeah, my primary goal would be to you know rationalize the government, make sense out of it. Why why do we have so many uh, authorities? Why do we have you know uh, so many uh, uh, rules and regulations? Um, and one of the things I just want to point out here on the stage is that you know there's this this fighting between uh, Democrats and Republicans that we constantly see, beating each other up, Trump versus Clinton, and all this. Kind of, so I, you know this is one of the ways I'm not answering your question directly, but I think the Libertarian Party is the most potential for becoming a major third party in this country. That's why I think voters should really look at our our uh, ticket in New York and just look at us uh, as a national entity. Okay. So, Mr. Trichter, on the controller's power to audit uh, state agencies and authorities and, and towns and villages and such, uh, how would you use that yeah, power? Yeah, I will answer that question. And first, I just want to point out, though, that of course Tom DiNapoli is not responsible for the Great Recession. However, he underperformed other large pension funds over the same period, including the Great Recession. So he performed worse than other pension funds. As for hedge funds providing a hedge on the poor performance during the Great Recession, over the 11 years you've been in office, Tom, your hedge fund portfolio has performed less than 1%, and they've charged you $6 billion for the privilege. So I really don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about Let's a hedge. Let's move on to the audit power, please. The broad constitutional authority of the state controller to audit every state agency, every state entity, and every public authority is tremendous. It's also one of the more powerful roles of the office. It is the controller's responsibility, for instance, inter, uh, for instance, to audit the MTA. Yet what we know about the major problems at the MTA are due to one reporter at the New York Times, one policy analyst at the Manhattan Institute, and one policy analyst at the CBC. All that we know about the signal problems, the infrastructure crumbling, high labor costs, and also the shift from maintenance and good repair work to these mega projects that do nothing to serve current consumers of the subway system and have basically come at the expense of state of good repair work, the crumbling subways. All of that we know from the New York Times, CBC, and MI. None of that we know from DiNapoli, who has audited the MTA 61 times and found none of the major problems that are wrong with the MTA. He is the one Albany politician responsible for finding out what's wrong with our infrastructure at the MTA before things start to break. Okay, and he was I'm asleep sure to well, there's so First, much of what John says. On, yeah, on MTA, so much of what John says is just plain wrong, and there's not the time in this format to answer all of his uh, his crazy notions. So we don't spend six billion dollars on hedge fund fees. I just that's just a minor point. Uh, the audit power is a very important part of the responsibility, and we have a, a professional audit team. Our auditors are civil service people. They're CPAs. They're trained auditors. They have professional credentials that they have to adhere to. They're peer reviewed. They work with me, and I appreciate Mark's uh, acknowledging uh, some of our audit work and. We appreciated your suggestion on some of that work. And uh, they look for high-risk areas, you know, certainly in terms of Medicaid, where we've had significant opportunities for cost recovery and saving. MTA, just read the audits. We put them online. That issue of signals, we identified that in 2016, before New York Times or anybody else was writing about that. So uh, the MTA is a, another uh, very important high-impact area. We have a number of audits underway now. We want to do more there. You know, with the authorities, though, just as with state agencies, the ultimate responsibility would be with the authorities, with the board members who are appointed to be the leaders, with the state agencies, with the uh, commissioners, and with the executive departments. The strength of our audits is the credibility of the work that we do. And in many cases, we've effectuated change. In many cases, when you read the response to our audits, an agency will say, oh, well, we're, do we're already doing that. Well, they're doing that because we knocked on the door and we came in and we started looking. We've saved taxpayers money through our audit work. And local governments were very often the only uh, entity out there providing that independent review on local finances. Reading through, just a quick follow-up, reading through a lot of the audits that your office has done, it seems as though, and this can of course be valuable, but a lot of them take a look at small pieces of an agency or a program. Is there room for doing more broad audits of, um, for instance, the MTA more broadly, but also of, of a state agency? Well, you know, particularly with MTA, we've, we've done about 30 reports which take the broader look, financial condition reports that do look at the big issues and the big questions. And, and those reports over the years have repeatedly pointed out the need for the various funding par partners to step up to the plate, the, the inadequacy of the funding for the capital program. We have taken that, that big view. And, and you know, right now we, we have a number of audits underway with the MTA because everybody understands it is, a, it is at a crisis point and it is at a point where everyone is focused. But certainly 
certainly going into next year's session, one of the biggest pieces is the legislature has to work together with the governor, come up with an additional revenue stream. That is essential. And we will continue our audits to see that the MTA keeps on track with the subway action plan, with the fast forward plan, but so much of it gets back to having the money to do the proper repairs and reinvestment in the infrastructure. We've been sounding the alarm on that for, for years. Uh, if, if it's not always listened to, well, maybe it's time people looked at our reports that go back over the past decade and see that we've been tracking very carefully the gaps in the MTA as we do with other state agencies and other public authorities. So moving on to our next question, another major uh, responsibility of the role. We're actually coming back to start with you again here, Comptroller DiNapoli. Uh, after this question, we will move into our cross-examination round so you can prepare your question for one of your opponents then. But first, one more question on the role of the Comptroller. And we start with you, Comptroller DiNapoli. Budget oversight and evaluating the state budget. How have you approached that? Uh, how would you approach it differently in another term? And have you done enough to keep state finances and the state budget process where it should be? Is there enough transparency? Um, have you have you looked at uh, the the issues of debt and the lack of savings in a way that uh, has helped the state's fiscal picture? Well, you know, mentioned several topics we've sounded the alarm on. Uh, ultimately, though, the budget is passed by the legislature and approved by the governor after being initially proposed by the governor. So our role is one of lending a voice. And what we've tried to do with our budget reports and what we'll continue to do is not only focus on the short term but on the long term. And that's where we see concern. Out year budget gaps uh, approaching $18 billion over the next few years. Uh, not putting enough money aside for our rainy day funds has been an issue that we've identified over the past three or four years particularly. Uh, the heavy reliance on lump sum appropriations without any clear definition of how the money is, is going to be spent. But we have our voice, and I think it's been a strong voice, and a number of legislators have uh, echoed the concerns we've identified. But ultimately, it is the responsibility of the legislature and the governor to make sure that these issues are addressed. We're going to continue to be aggressive uh, with our voice, and uh, I hope that that will result in, in some more changes. We have specific proposals on reforming debt in the state, some of which require statutory changes, some of which re require constitutional changes. We're going to continue to sound the alarm. We have the bully pulpit. We're going to continue to use that. Ultimately, much of this rests with the legislature and the governor. Okay. Mr. Dunley, uh, how would you approach the budget oversight role of the controller? I would be more aggressive on, on, on the budget oversight. Uh, there's certainly a number of reforms with respect to clean contracting and oversight of the authority, some of which Tom has proposed but really need to, to be enacted. Uh, I would use the uh, certification power perhaps a little bit more aggressively. Um, one concern is the state keeps on passing state budgets that fail to comply with existing court orders on a uh, level of financing for schools, particularly in low income and rural communities. I think the uh, controller's office should talk more about tax fairness. Uh, one of the things I asked the controller's office to do was examine how much money the state would save if we went to a state single payer system. Uh, the state controller is responsible for monitoring the tax gap. I oppose. Uh, the tax gap. I think we should go back to Section 54 of the state finance law, which shares 8% uh, of the state revenues with local governments. I think that would be a lot more effective in terms of reducing local property taxes and, um, you know, increasing um, the fiscal health. A lot of the uh, towns and cities in the state are on, uh, you know, fiscal stress, and we got to really crack down on the authorities. The authorities are out of control. I think it's $56 billion of debt they've incurred, largely, in my opinion, in circumvention of the state constitution. Okay, Mr. Gallaudet, uh, the budget oversight powers of the role, how would you approach those? Um, I guess I would like to say that, uh, you know, any, any viewer who is uh, tuning in right now and their eyes are glazing over at all the uh, all the intricate details we're, we're going over. Uh, uh, consider the uh, the current system of, uh, of this duopoly called the Democrats and the Republicans. They battle each other. We've got one uh, you know pit bull over here. We've got the, the, the uh, existing controller uh, defending himself. Um, you know that that I see is what what is broken about our government uh, both on the state level and the national level. So um, if you want to end the duopoly uh, consider libertarians. I think we are the one party that has a chance of becoming a major third party um, in okay, New York. I, we, uh, I think we've heard. No, no, heard I, I want to continue. Uh, um, and uh, you know, you know, Google Larry Sharp. He's he's running for the governor position. He he is uh, you know the head of our ticket. Uh, if you really want to get in depth on what our views are, um, and I will you know I'll comment further on it. Okay, in, thank in you, Mr. Trichter, on the budget oversight powers. So, just to be clear, the controller has 
paid $6 billion to hedge fund managers and private equity fund managers over the course of his tenure. That is an empirical fact, and I calculated it. He spent $1 billion, or paid $1 billion to them, just in fiscal year 2018. On the budget certification power, I mentioned when I started that this office is tremendously powerful and underutilized. One particular area is on budget certification. It's the controllers, within the controller's authority, to refuse certifying the budget each and every year. And I would use that refusal to certification as leverage to negotiate a much better budget and fix the dysfunctional budget process that we current have, currently have, which are three men in a room. I would force my way into the room, make it four men. But better than that, I would open up the process to public view using the leverage of certification. The budget is notoriously an awful document, the big ugly, they call it. In 2019, it included a $3 million expenditure for a golf tournament. It included $100,000 for tourism to the impoverished New York uh, uh, locality known as East Hampton. Guess what? This controller certified the budget. In 2016, it was so late, it landed on lawmakers' desks in the wee hours of the morning, and the controller himself said, it's too late for us to analyze. Guess what? He certified it anyway. In 2014, it included so much pork, it was called the porkiest juice pork thing budget that was ever passed since the Great Recession. It included $750 million in pork that was unaccounted for. This controller pointed that out, and then he certified it anyway. I would refuse to certify any budget like that. I would take my pen and go home. I have a much more robust view of how to use this office. Okay, I'm a pit bull who would bark. Yeah, I mean, the Saudi prince, uh, he's making things up as he goes along. The controller has no authority to certify the budget. It, there, it, there is no statutory constitutional authority for us to do that. You can't make up law. There is no certification of the state budget. Section 1, the only Article thing, 5 the of the only state thing that we do is that we 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 verify that the the appropriation bills, which his Republican new found Republican friends have passed as well, that they have been enacted, so that the that government can continue, and that's tied to the the issue of the reform of if the budget bills aren't passed, the legislators don't get paid. It's not a certification of the budget. It is not approving expenditures. That is the responsibility of the legislature and the governor. And, and, if, and if you're going to try to assert an authority that you don't have, well, all you're going to do is gum up the works and create more gridlock than we have already. You're going to end up in court. There is no certification yeah. role for New the York state, state controller. Court of Appeals in 1971, okay. so Posner versus Levin. This Levitt. is actually, you're going to have an opportunity to ask one of your opponents a question. We're going to keep the question short, not speeches and then a question, so I'll jump in if I need to. Um, but we're actually going to start with you, Mr. Gallaudet, with an opportunity to ask one of your opponents a brief question, and then we'll keep the answers. We're not going to go back and forth. We'll keep the answers brief, um, but it's your opportunity to raise something, perhaps, that has not been raised yet in our debate. Okay. Uh, I guess I'd like to ask the uh, Republican uh, candidate, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, how do you justify anybody voting for you? We, uh, we all know that Mr. DiNapoli is going to win this race. Uh, the polls, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a fait accompli, but... Uh, it's pretty dead certain. Why, why should the voter waste their vote on the Republican Party, yeah, especially in New York? Uh, my, my suggestion would be vote Libertarian okay. because... Uh, Question you, Mr. Trichter. Because I'm a professional. I'm not running as an ideologue or a party guy. I'm running with the, as a guy with the right private sector skills for the job. I also think they should vote for me because this controller has used <laughs> the powers of the office to protect the status quo fiscally, which we've discussed a little bit to, uh, today but also culturally. He's brought the powers of the office to bear to protect his friends and his allies who voted him into office over the objection of every editorial board in New York State in ways th that, are, uh, that are problematic. And I will save one of those ways for my question for, for the Comptroller to Napoli when it's my turn. It is your turn. Mr. Comptroller, in 2011, your close friend and political ally, Assemblyman Vito Lopez, sexually harassed two female staffers. Your office helped negotiate a secret settlement with those staffers that included a gag order over the objections of the victims, and then you used taxpayer dollars as hush money to cover up that harassment. You have never apologized, Mr. Comptroller. Will you apologize now for any role in that cover-up? Well, the question, again, is full of all kinds of inaccuracies, which is the consistent pattern of uh, Jonathan Trichter. Uh, my office was not involved in the negotiation of that settlement. Our office plays the role of payments. We do about 125,000 payments a day, uh, and it was entered into the electronic payment system. Our office was consulted for any tax co consequences that would come out of that. But uh, our role is a very minor role in payments of any settlements, and there are many that happen on a regular basis for the state. 
in the aftermath of what happened, and look, let's not lose sight. Women were victimized. They were entitled to some justice and entitled to, to compensation. That was the agreement. We made sure that they, that they were paid. There was no secret payment. We have no secret payments. Uh, all payments are, are, are public. And in the aftermath of, of what happened with the Lopez situation, we did institute changes, more transparency, more accountability, requiring any agency, not just the legislature, if there is a settlement involving an elected official, elected state official, that had to be duly noted, a more clear certification by whatever entity, legislature or, uh, or a state agency, that in fact there was a complete review, that it was a, a, a legal process. And of course, we've all evolved uh, governmentally on this issue. We now have in New York State a new sexual harassment statute requiring broad compliance with uh, public entities, with, with private entities as well. So, you know, that question just overloads misinformation, misstatement of facts about my office's role in that matter. And uh, I think the changes that we instituted in the aftermath of the Lopez case were positive and responsive. We all need to create a workplace that is free of sexual harassment. It is your turn to ask a question of one of your opponents. Well, I feel, you know, Mr. Gold, I'm, I'm glad he's here at the debate. He's gotten the least attention in this campaign of all of us. And I'd like to just give you the chance to speak a little bit more about your vision for the office and why you're running, because uh, I don't think you've gotten enough attention from the press or the broader okay. public. So just maybe, an open-ended, make, make your Jeanette pitch. Maybe was a, a near guarantee to win. You, you earned yourself a few more seconds here to, to discuss <laughs> your uh, campaign. Well, uh, you know, that's, that's part of the problem. He, he is almost uh, guaranteed to win. Uh, in the state of New York because it is so uh, Democrat uh, uh, influenced. Uh, voters typically vote Democrat. Um, so yeah, no, I, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm here to promote the, the libertarian ticket overall. Um, and again, I think the reason is that we want to end this duopoly of, uh, you know, this constant uh, bickering back and forth. It's just, uh, it's just what government has, has been reduced to. It's, I think that people are sick of it. Uh, the last election, uh, the presidential election, we almost, you know, uh, th you know, there was certainly a call for, uh, you know, another candidate that could, could rise and challenge Trump and Clinton, who nobody seemed to like. Uh, and again, I would say, uh, one, Google Larry Sharp. I think he's a man that's, that's going places. Two, uh, think about your vote. You know, carefully vote. What, what are you, you know, what are you really trying to accomplish? Uh, how can you best uh, uh, vote to achieve change? And again, I would argue that, especially in the state of New York, uh, if you vote libertarian, you will uh, affect, have more chance of affecting change than if you voted, say, Republican or Independent or, or even the Green Party. Okay, and Mr. Dunley, your, your opportunity to ask an opponent a question. So I have a question for Tom. Um, Vicki Fuller, who is the Chief Investment Officer of, of the Controller's Office, recently left and took a position uh, on the board of the Williams Company. And a number of the climate change groups are quite you know, concerned about the appearance of a conflict of interest. And I know that they have filed a you know, request for investigation with Jayco, which probably eventually would go So the, the, the question is, how do you, you know, take steps in the future to you know, provide a level of um, comfort to taxpayers that we don't have people in those positions, which may in fact you know, be looking for a golden parachute on, on their exit based on their work as a chief investment officer? Well, you know, I mean, we're $209 billion fund, as you know. We're inv invested in virtually every public company that's out there. So, you know, had, had Ms. Fuller retired and decided to flip hamburgers at McDonald's, would that have been a conflict because we have McDonald's stock? You know, so I think you have to look at some of this in the context of reality. Ms. Fuller announced that she was retiring and leaving, leaving the system. Uh, as such, she's entitled to live her own life. Uh, she is, though, bound by uh, the, the ethics requirements. So there's a two-year bar on, on her doing any business with the fund. I don't know that as a board of director member that she would have any business with the fund anyway, but she's covered by that as well. She's uh, an experienced investor. She's uh, an African-American woman. Uh, that's a category very underrepresented on corporate boards. Probably no surprise that when she announced her retirement, there would be some boards who would be interested in her service. There may be more boards down the road. But that is her life. Those are her choices. Uh, the investment decisions that were made in the past were made on the merits of the investment decisions, not based on, on any expectation of future employment. Do you have any sense, just to quickly follow up on yeah. it, it's, it's obviously been in the news a bit, do you have any sense that she had direct involvement in choosing to buy debt of the company that she then joined the, the well, board of directors? You know, as I understand, the debt, the debt purchase was in 2015. It was three years before. So I don't know if people are making the allegation that 
the fixed income group that made the recommendation to do that, it didn't come from, from Vicky, that, that the fact that that happened was somehow tied to Vicky getting a board appointment three years later. If, if that's what people are alleging, there might be some facts that they need to report to the proper authorities. But to just create a conspiracy theory, putting all that together, like most of the investments in that company were through the index funds, passive. They were there before Vicky came there. They're there now that she's left. So this notion that she was directing investment to this company, you know, I think it's an overstatement of the reality. As chief investment officer, she obviously pres presides over the entire fund, but that doesn't mean that she was directing these investments so that she would get a board position years later. Okay, so we're through the cross-examination round. We've got a few more questions and a lightning round of questions uh, be before we go to closing statements, but a couple more questions on the role of the controller in state finances, and we're gonna start with you here, Mr. Dunley. The state has tens of billions of dollars of outstanding debt, hundreds of billions if you include authority debt that, that has been uh, accrued. And there are also post-employment benefit debt, uh, OPEB debt that, that increases that amount that are not necessarily uh, covered or prepared for. What would you do about the positioning of debt around the state if you're elected controller? Well, as I said earlier, I'm, I've been very opposed to the level of debt that the state has incurred. There's a state constitution requirement that debt incurred by the state is supposed to be approved by uh, the taxpayers. And, you know, under Robert Moses, we came up with this legal fiction of authorities uh, to circumvent that. As I mentioned, when Erasmus Coynan, who is the mayor of the city of Albany, um, basically built the Empire State Plaza and leased it to Rockefeller to circumvent that debt, Nyberg, which I helped start and was on the board, sue them on that. Uh, how you now curb that level of debt and cut it back is a big challenge. Obviously, we need to stop incurring debt. I think we have to rein in the authorities. There's been a lot of legislation that's been introduced uh, to make the authorities more transparent. They need to really begin to follow the rules that other state agencies uh, occur. Uh, this is Skyler Management Company, a nonprofit uh, that has been used to sort of circumvent even the limited restrictions, you know, on the authorities. But I think we have to really cut back on debt. How best you do that? That's why I got 2,700 employees and going to be working on that once I'm elected. Okay, Mr. Gallaudet. Uh, look, I have no no uh, silver bullet, no easy answers on on how to tackle this issue. What I can guarantee you is that if you continue to vote for either a Democrat or a Republican. Nothing will change. Nothing. Uh, it's again, it's why uh, I suggest you look at the, uh, the libertarian ticket as a way to create a third party that will challenge the duopoly that we have in the, uh, in the, in the state and the country. Okay. Mr. Trichter, uh, on this issue of debt, what would you do to either rein it in or uh, make systemic adjustments? Yeah. I do have a silver bullet or a magic solution to all of this. This office is tremendously powerful. In 2017, the Comptroller issued a debt report where he claimed our crushing debt burden on a process called backdoor borrowing. Well, it turns out what he didn't report was that the controller himself has to sign off on most backdoor borrowing in New York State. And I know this because as a public finance banker, when I was underwriting bonds, we had to get sign off whenever we did bond deals, so they wouldn't close. And we had to get the sign off from the controller's office. The controller has signed off on $32 billion in backdoor debt since he's been in office in 2007. And if he refused to sign off on backdoor debt, he could unilaterally end the process once and for all and institute his own debt policy. This is something he absolutely has the authority to do. Good government groups, policy wonks, have been wrestling their hands and scratching their heads on how to fix this problem for decades. The controller himself shares the goal. He recommended a constitutional amendment to end backdoor debt. I'm telling you, he could do it himself if he just refuses to sign off on the debt deals. So I've heard I you would have the difference of opinion on this. We're going to move to you, Comptroller DiNapoli. Um, if you want to explain, uh, Mr. Trichter actually seems to have you know, put your idea forward uh, in terms of that you think it needs a constitutional amendment. But if you want to capture that a little bit further and then talk sure. about in another term what you might push or do about sure. the state debt. Sure. Well, I'm glad we have a, an area of agreement. Uh, again, you, you, know, you, you can't create authority uh, or powers that you don't have. So we do have the opportunity in, for some of the debt, for negotiated uh, debt sales, com ones that are competitively uh, arranged for, do not go through our office. With, um, with the negotiated debt, billion. Uh, we in fact do push back in terms of conditions. We've Signed done that uh, with billion. an empty. Please, please. Can, I, can I continue? Right. Thank please. you. Uh, we've done that with MTA debt, we've done that with LIPA debt, we've done that with various public authority debt uh, across the state. 
And we have, in fact, gotten better terms that benefit taxpayers and have resulted in a more responsible management of debt. Uh, but again, it is not our authority, nor should it be our role, to just stop the debt that happens in the state. Uh, you know, we're concerned about the subways and MTA infrastructure investment. Are we just going to stop? the construction projects because we want to make a point about too much debt. No, we have a limited role, but it's a role that we've exercised very fully. And I would like to see a constitutional uh, prohibition on backdoor borrowing. I agree with Mark. It, it, it really should go back to, I think, w w the implication of what you were saying is that we should go back to the voters approving the debt. That really is the ultimate check on having too much debt. We've sounded the alarm on that repeatedly. Uh, we've, we've argued for stopping the backdoor borrowing by changing the laws in the state and the Constitution and returning to voter-approved debt. And when you say you have pushed back on some of the debt that's been issued, can you give an example of that, something specific oh, uh, that... M M M MTA debt, I mean, we issued a report in 2010 that, that had three or four specific examples, MTA and a couple of other authorities, 2014, 2015, 2016, that's all part of the process. We don't just rubber stamp what comes before us. Our staff reviews the terms and conditions and we push back on, on, on the term, on making sure there, 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 there's a, a, a smarter management that will benefit taxpayers. Uh, we don't like long duration. We like a level uh, debt payment structure. We're always pushing back on that. And we've had a number of successes. But we don't approach it by stopping and say, saying, no, you can't do any debt, because we understand that there are very often important purposes that are, that, are, that are behind that debt. But we need to restructure the whole way we look at it. I'm glad you mentioned OPEB. You know, we push for the state to set up the opportunity for an OPEB trust, other post-employment benefits. We don't, seconds, please. Yeah, yeah we, we, we don't do a good job of that in the state. We now have the opportunity. The legislature needs to appropriate money to that, as New York City has done. That is a big cost item that's looming as part of our financial risk down the road. So before we move into a quick lightning round and then closing statements, the last uh, more substantive question is related to the federal tax reforms and what New York should or should not do. Um, if you have an idea from the perch of controller, if you be, ascend to that position or you keep that position, are there things that New York should be doing in relation to the federal tax reforms that were passed at the end of, of 2017 uh, into this year um, that New York finances uh, are of concern to many taxpayers, uh, Mr. Trichter. We'll start yeah, so you. I try to stick to the roles of the controller when it comes to running for this office, and I've tried to be substantive and stay away from issues that are outside of my lane. And that's one issue that's potentially outside of my lane, and so I haven't really discussed it. I can tell you a little bit about it, but or I can talk to you about it from a personal level. But first, let me also just target something that the controller said about his oversight and review role of MTA debt, which he stressed in his answer when I pointed out that he has the authority to unilaterally end backdoor borrowing. He pointed out that he reviews the terms of the debt. So the New York Times discovered that the MTA was paying a fee to the state whenever it issued debt. Uh, over 325, it was about $328 million worth over the course of the Times, the Times discovered. The state was basically milking the MTA of funds that it could have used for infrastructure maintenance to prevent the crumbling assets that it currently has. Indeed, the controller reviewed all of that debt, and he never noticed that fee. When the D Division of Budget was told about it, or when it was discovered, the governor and the Division of Budget was embarrassed, and they said they would stop it. DiNapoli signed off on all of those debt deals, and he, according to those more own words, reviewed all of the fees and the structures connected to that debt. Okay, I'm going to give you a chance to answer that, and then we can move into your thoughts on tax reform. Sure. I mean, there he goes again, to quote uh, someone. Uh, it's a statutory fee. It's statutory. We pointed out that that's an issue and suggested that there be changes in statute. But you, you, you can't make your own laws, John, as you go along. You can it's a statutory requirement. To sign you know, off, it's, you it's, could have it's, pointed it out. Well, because yeah, we follow, we follow the laws. Not you. We, we follow the laws of the state. Uh, that's the important role no of, being, of being the control. Why don't you move into any thoughts you have about what well, the state might you know, need to do I on I give the government legislature credit for trying to come up with some options uh, you know, to, to have people setting up these charitable trusts as a way to pay for education and health care costs as a way to get around the cap on state local tax, tax deductibility. You know, the, the obvious problem is the IRS has poured cold water on that. So I think th that it is an area that we have to continue to look at uh, if there are other ways. I mean, certainly in the short run, it means for government at every level, you're going to have to work even harder to control costs because, you know, some of the benefit that we had with the deduct deductibility is now capped at $10,000. So, you know, I think it makes our audit work uh, even more important. And I think the other thing we have to do is really, and it's too soon to tell, what will be the impact on taxpayers in New York? Will we, in fact, see a flight 
out of the state because of this. Uh, I know many people are concerned about the higher income New Yorkers that pay a, a higher proportion of the state income tax. I'm also worried about the, the middle class families, uh, the folks that don't have that second home in Florida that they could switch their address to. You know, I live on Long Island. Uh, $10,000 in property taxes alone is a modest property tax bill. So there are implications uh, of, of the federal taxes that are, are very concerning in the short run. In the long run, if they're going to cut federal programs to pay for that tax cut, New York is going to be hurt again. Okay. Mr. Dunning? I admit to be pretty skeptical about the value of these charitable trusts that the governor talked about and what, in fact, uh, who would benefit uh, from them. I uh, happen to be the press secretary for uh, Howie Hawkins, who's a Green Party candidate for governor. We have certainly articulated that uh, since this huge tax cut was supposed to result in higher wages for workers and reinvestment uh, in businesses, and that has not occurred, uh, we have supported you know, trying to recapture, say, $10 billion of, of that tax giveaway and reinvest that uh, in New York like was supposed to be done. One tax issue that I have been supportive of, I should have mentioned earlier, uh, is a carbon tax. It would be best done at the federal level, but basically hold corporate polluters responsible for the damage caused by uh, burning fossil fuels and climate change. If this federal government's unlikely to do that, uh, you know, I support an, an act in a state carbon tax. Okay. And Mr. Gallaudet? One area I might agree on the green, with the Green Party. Um, I, I, for one, would like to get rid of the income tax uh, in New York State. I'd like to get rid of the federal income tax. A tax on income is a tax on productivity. It's uh, one of the dumbest ideas ever man has ever come up with. But that being said, uh, that's you know, one of our libertarian principles. Um, you know, if, if you have to tax something, tax something you don't want. You don't want to, you don't want to happen. That would be carbon. So I've been a long advocate of replacing, say, a corporate income tax uh, with a corporate carbon tax, um, you, uh, get rid of the uh, in income tax on, on individuals. We don't need it. It's intrusive. In fact, uh, I, have a, I have an October 15th deadline right now. This week I'm spending just about the whole week preparing tax, you know, getting, getting this tax thing done. So uh, okay. that would be my answer. Okay. We're going to move into just a few quick yes or no questions and then closing statements. We're going to start with you for the first question and, and change it up a bit, uh, Comptroller DiNapoli. So yes or no or a very, very short answer to these questions. The state uh, so-called millionaire's tax that's set to expire, I believe, next year. Should it stay, and should it be raised additionally, as some are calling for? Well, we need the revenue. It's up to the legislature to decide it. So in the absence of other revenue, my expectation would be it would probably be extended. Mr. Dunley? Increase it, raise it. Mr. Gallaudet? Uh, we, we, we heard your take we, on, we, on taxes. Uh, we yes. need the revenue. We need, yeah, this, is, this is what they say all the time. It's, again, why, if you want, it, if you want things to stay the same, Vote for Understood. the uh, Dems and probes. Mr. Trichter. No, we already rely on the personal income tax way too much. 40% of the personal income tax comes through the millionaires. These are very mobile people. They Let can move expire. to Florida. Okay. Mr. Dunley, starting with you, should the statewide minimum wage be $15 per hour? $20. Okay. Mr. Gallaudet. Uh, in principle, I'm against uh, minimum wage laws, but uh, practically, yeah, yeah, maybe somewhere between the $15 and $20. Okay, Mr. Program. Trichter. No, it's hurting upstate farmers. It hurts uh, fast food industries. I'm a free markets guy. Okay, Mr. Napoli. Yes. Okay, starting with you, Mr. Gallaudet. Do you believe there should be a congestion pricing scheme uh, put into place for New York City? I'm not totally against it. Uh, I'd have to I'd have to look at the details. Okay. Mr. Trichter. Yeah, Ben, really, the controller's got a lot of powers, and you, you're asking lightning questions that have nothing to do with the controller's I think these office. are issues that some voters might want to know related to finance. I'm running for New York State controller. Okay. There's no, no answer relation on to that. the office. Okay. Controller DiNapoli? It's, it's probably the most likely solution to the question of what will be the additional revenue source for the MTA. Again, it's for others to decide that, not the controller. Um, but. We, we need something, and okay. that seems to be the one with the, with the broadest support. Okay, Mr. Dunley? Uh, yes, with the possible um, exception, reduction for uh, zero emission vehicles. So we're going to move into closing statements. We're going to start with you, Mr. Trichter, and actually work towards my left here. Uh, you have a minute to talk to voters and give them your push for why they should vote for you on November 6th. Thanks, Ben. So I've tried to run for controller based on substance, not party, not, ideolo uh, not ideology. And I just find it challenging when I put forth data and substantive ideas and facts that the current controller is able to basically call lies. It's just not true. And I just don't know where to begin. For one thing, he says budget certification isn't a responsibility or of the controller. In fact, the New York State Supreme Court ruled in 1971, Posner versus Levitt, that the controller may have standing to test the validity of state budgets, but is not obligated to do so. 
Now, I seize on the first part of that ruling, which says the Comptroller may have standing to test the validity of the state budget, and I would. I would take my pen and go home. I would litigate it and I would test it. This Comptroller takes the second part of that ruling, is not obligated to do so, and prefers to basically duck and cover. The Office of the State Comptroller is the Chief Fiscal Officer and top watchdog. Yes, I'm a bit of a pit bull. Yes, I would bark. That's what the job calls for. It calls for bringing accountability and scrutiny, an independent outsider, to all of what's wrong in Albany. It could single-handedly fix so many of the vexing fiscal problems in New York State if it had somebody willing to disrupt the status quo for the good and ordinary New Yorkers. That's how I would approach the office, and it's very different from how this controller has run the office. Thank you. Mr. Gallaudet, coming to you for a closing statement. Uh, yes. Um, again, my, uh, my general theme here is uh, uh, to vote carefully. Don't waste your vote. Uh, the state of New York is uh, a place where uh, I think a, a vibrant third party would be a, a huge asset, not only to the state, but to the nation. Um, one of the reasons I sort of got back into, uh, into politics is the last election, the uh, Libertarian Party got 3.6% of the national vote in the presidential election. Uh, if we would gotten 5%, uh, that would have given us uh, third party status. According to the government, uh, federal government, we would have received funds once we hit third. Now, not that I'm in favor of government doling out funds to parties, but you know, we'll, we'll take what we can get. Uh, New York single-handedly could have pushed, uh, pushed uh, that vote over 5%. Uh, if people in New York, instead of voting independent and voting Republican, if they thought about it, you know, that's a waste, especially in the presidential election. So I'm asking uh, people to, to carefully consider where they place their vote. If they vote independent or if they vote for the Republican, uh, most likely going to lose. If they vote for the Democrat, they're going to vote for the Democrat anyway. But if you're, if you're on the fence, uh, consider carefully uh, uh, the strategy of ending the duopoly in New York and in the country. Thank you. Mr. Dunley. I'm Mark Dunley, and I'm the Green Party candidate um, for, for state controller. I've spent 45 years of my life um, fighting for open government, more transparency, more responsible treatment of our tax dollars. Uh, I think he can do a, job, a good job as a state controller. But I'm running on the issue of divesting the state pension funds from fossil fuels. Uh, I do think we need a green to watch the greens. One of the big criticisms of, of Tom is that he's the nicest guy in Albany. Uh, and that may not be what we need in terms of trying to crack down on the corruption. But when the New York Times devoted an entire edition of their magazine to the proposition that the world is doomed uh, because we lack the political will to move to 100 percent clean energy as rapidly as possible and to stop fossil fuels. We need all hands on deck. Divesting is a very small, simple step. But if Tom DiNapoli does that, he's going to be a world-class hero on climate change. And if I convince him during this campaign to divest, then my campaign will have been successful. Thank you. And Comptroller DiNapoli. Well, I'm very statement. proud to already be a world-class hero in terms of how our pension fund deals be. with the climate issue. And uh, if uh, be, a reputation of being nice means that I treat people with respect and with openness, uh, I'll, I'll take that. That's how I was raised and I'm, I'm too old to change. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that I've done as state controller for uh, the past, uh, I guess, going on 12 years now. I inherited an office that was mired in scandal. Unfortunately, my predecessor ended up in prison. I had to restore the integrity and the value of the office. And then we were faced with the global financial crisis and the Great Recession. Well, I've navigated through tough times. I've used the bully pulpit of this office to call for important reforms in state spending, fiscal and budget practices. I have used the audit authority to look out for the taxpayer interest at the state level and the local level. And the 1.1 million New Yorkers and their families who depend on the strength of our pension fund can rest easy at night because we have a 98% funded pension plan. And we're doing smart things with our investments. We're a very active and engaged shareholder, moving corporations to do the right thing. There's a lot of work to do in New York, including returning your lost money through unclaimed funds. But I have a record that I'm very, very proud of. I have a team of professionals that do the job each and every day with, with a great deal of, of belief in the mission of the Comptroller's Office. Very proud to be running on five lines, Democrat, uh, working families, independents, uh, the Reform Party, and the Women's Equality Party. I have that kind of support and a lot of editorial support as well, I think, by Election Day because I'm doing the job in the right way. A lot of folks have come and gone over the past few years. Tom DiNapoli continues to be on the job, my only boss, the people of the state of New York. I hope I've earned your vote once again. Thank you, and thank you all for being here and participating in this debate today. And thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. The general election is on Tuesday, November 6th. For more information on voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates running, please visit racetorepresent.com or the League of Women Voters website, lwvny.org, or us at gothamgazette.com. 
Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.